Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to some of our participants. Welcome to our webinar of today. This is brought to you by the CGIAR Research Program on Policies, Institutions, and Markets. My name is Karen Brooks. I'm the director of the program. This is our fourth webinar in the 2017 series, and we're very pleased that you could join us today. Our topic is Strengthening Developing Country Seed Systems and Markets. Policy trade-offs, unintended consequences, and operational realities. I'm very pleased that we have as our speaker today, David Spielman. David is a senior research fellow in the Environment and Production Technology Division at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute. He's based in Washington, DC. His research agenda is a very broad one over a number of years. Um, he's covered a range of topics, including agricultural science, technology, and innovation policy. Of course, work on seed systems and input markets, which we'll hear about today. And he's also worked in the areas of community-driven development and other topics as well. Now, prior to his posting in Washington, David was uh, with the IFPRI office in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia working with the Knowledge, Innovation, and Capacity Division. In the past in his career, he's worked on agriculture and rural development issues for the World Bank, for the Aga Khan Development Network in Pakistan, and for a number of other organizations. His main focus geographically is on East Africa and South Asia. David received his PhD in economics from American University in 2003. He has a master's in development studies from the London School of Economics and a BA in international relations from Tufts University. So we're very pleased that you could be with us, David. And we're also very pleased that we have our, a wide range of participants. We've had um, registration for this webinar um, in larger numbers than in our past. And that's either a sign that the information about the web the webinar series is getting out, or that there's just tremendous interest in seed systems, which I think we all share. So before I hand over to David, I want to explain how we're going to handle the webinar today. As usual, we'll have a presentation, and it will last around 30 minutes. Then we'll go into a question and answer session. We'll handle the question and answer session in a way that we invite listeners in the course of David's presentation to send in questions via the chat windows on the right hand side of your screens. We're not going to open the discussion to call-ins or voice-ins from the participants because that gets challenging to manage. But we will monitor very carefully the questions that you send in via the chat box. We'll collate those questions and group the ones that are quite similar and then I will convey those to David and we'll have the discussion in that way. And we've found that that allows us to handle the question and answer and the discussion period um, efficiently since we really want to spend only an hour on this. So with that um, introduction and um, guidance on how we're going to proceed, I'm very happy to hand over to David to tell us about seat systems. Great. Well, thank you very much, Karen. And thanks to everyone for joining this webinar at a time slot, which may for many be quite early, for others quite late. Um, my aim here is to chalk, up, chalk out some basic principles to help us better understand the effects of changes in public policy on seed systems and markets in developing countries. Many of you, many of us, are involved in processes of policy change aimed at improving timely access to quality seeds and traits for smallholder farmers. Many of our development partners, uh, some of whom are, are, in, are participating in this webinar, have invested in plant breeding and seed systems projects to achieve this very objective. Similarly, many of our partners in scientific research, in private enterprise, and civil society have invested in breeding better varieties or providing smallholders with products and services that target the very same objective. So I'd argue that these investments will only achieve their expected outcomes or impacts in the presence of a conducive policy environment a policy environment that provides the right signals and incentives to markets, to communities, and to farmers. Let me say at the outset that this webinar will not provide you with magic solutions. At best, we'll help frame the issues in a novel way, we'll develop a narrative that is hopefully compelling to you, and explain why policy change processes must be both crop and country specific. 
and we're going to do all of that within 30 minutes. So what do we expect from a better seed system? You know, historically, the seed systems have been the very vehicle for translating the genetic improvement of food staple crops into welfare improving productivity gains for smallholder farmers and food insecure households in the developing world. The starting point for this narrative, all of you know, is the monumental work on wheat rust resistance and high yielding, short duration rice and wheat varieties during the Green Revolution back in the 1960s and 70s. The key to these successes was it was a straightforward and well-articulated theory of change that remains pretty fundamental to our continued investment in plant breeding and seed systems. So what is this theory of change? Well, it starts with the adoption of improved varieties, right? This is the initial stage, the, the positive shock in the genetic quality of a crop that occurs when farmers switch from traditional varieties, let's say, to improved ones that are higher yielding, less susceptible to pests and diseases, more nutritious, or more valuable to consumers in the marketplace. This leads to a longer term process of continuous turnover in improved varieties as farmers increase the rate at which they replace one improved variety with another, along with sustained use of quality planting material or quality seed. That is the continuous change in the physical quality of seed as farmers replace saved seed with better quality seed obtained regularly from market exchanges. And this leads to those productivity gains I mentioned, increased on-farm yields, fewer losses or damage from biotic and abiotic stresses, greater nutritional content in the crop, or more value to consumers in the marketplace which ultimately leads to welfare gains for resource poor farmers and food insecure households through increased incomes, greater purchasing power and consumption of food, higher levels of nutrition and greater well-being. It's very simple, it's very direct and it's very elegant as a theory of change. But what makes seed systems so difficult to change? Why are we struggling with this issue? Why, do we, why are we talking about it here and now? We know that things that seem simple and elegant, like that theory of change pathway on the surface, are often complex and messy underneath the surface. So what makes seed systems so challenging to us? I'll go through them uh, point by point. First, there are real challenges in integrating formal and informal seed markets or seed systems for many crops and countries. For many crops, farmer seed selection and savings or farmer to farmer seed exchanges are the primary means of accessing better genetics or quality planting material. Those informal systems are critically important. For many crops and in many countries, they represent the only seed system available. And without efforts to integrate formal systems in which breeding and other activities take place, Governments and development partners simply can't affect change through their investments. Second, there are inherent difficulties for farmers in assessing genetic or physical quality of seed ex ante. Setting these markets for seed apart from many other product markets we're familiar with. At its core, the exchange of seed takes place in what we economists like to call a market for lemons. In any seed transaction, the farmer is typically unable to assess the quality of a seed or its embodied traits simply through visual inspection. However, seed sell sellers themselves may possess that very information. And if the seed seller uses that information to say, charge a price that is greater than what the seed is actually worth, then the exchange is inherently inefficient or even unfair. And that's precisely why many governments and development partners invest in projects on seed package labeling, branding, and e-verification to reduce these asymmetries of information between seed buyer and seed seller. Third, there are technical challenges for breeders who want to appropriate the gains from their investment in R&D and innovation. So for some crops, the reproductive biology means that the gains from a plant breeder's investment in crop improvement can be enjoyed, enjoyed by the farmer without remuneration back to the breeder. 
Farmers can purchase an improved variety in year one and save seed for several generations thereafter without losing any of the variety's desirable genetic attributes and without having to pay the breeder or the seed seller. The result? First, that puts a big damper on commercialization potential or, or in the private sector incentives in the absence of intellectual property rights, protections, or other rules that encourage private investment in breeding. Second, it requires the government to spend scarce fiscal resources on things like seed production and distribution because private sector might not be forthcoming. Third, or fourth, my fourth point, uh, on a more practical level, entrepreneurs and companies really in, in a lot of developing countries struggle to assess market demand for seed and then plan production accordingly. Seed producers are really, I'd say, rarely able to predict demand for seed and traits in a timely manner. Seed production often takes at least one to two years of advanced planning, but farmer demand or farmer decision making, it changes on a much shorter timeline. At the onset of any given season, farmers may change their expectation, expectations about rainfall, pest or disease pressures, prices of complementary inputs such as fertilizer, or what they think the market will prefer, the quality uh, of the crop that's ultimately consumed. And that affects their demand for particular seeds and traits. Add to this the technical difficulties of seed production, the vagaries of, of price and production risk that seed producers face, and you realize why the seed business is so tough to crack. Finally, there are real challenges in scaling up seed markets. Smallholder demand for seed is often fragmented in social, economic, and especially spatial terms. Long distances between farms, poor infrastructure networks, diverse agroecologies, or heterogeneous access to information, finance, and inputs, they all constrain uh, our ability to, to scale up projects in, in, in seed market development. That means that seed systems have to develop in a highly site-specific manner to accommodate, to accommodate the inherent diversity of farmers. So moving on. We ask the question, which public policies matter? Let me give you a short list. I would argue that there are only a few policy levers through which governments can achieve the overall goal of improving timely access to quality seed and traits for smallholder farmers. Let's enumerate them. First, seed laws and legislation. These are the overarching policies that govern who can participate in a seed system in a given country and how topics such as varietal registration and release quality assurance, production, and distribution are handled. Seed rules, regulations, and guidelines. These are the, 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 the laws or the, the regulations that provide the more technical elements required for effective implementation of public policy. Public investment in research, extension, and other public programs. These are designed to develop new varieties, popularize those varieties, and supply seed to farmers through anything from, say, small starter packs to bulk provision of seed for free or at cost or at some subsidized price or with some small profit margin for the producer. Next, seed producer subsidies and taxes. These are used to encourage private investment in the seed market, for example, through direct production subsidies, favorable terms of credit for producers, seed producers, duty-free equipment imports, R&D tax breaks, or simply state-owned production of seed. There are seed user subsidies and taxes designed to reduce the price of seed, including direct state-sponsored price discounts or indirect discounts that target reductions in transportation or storage costs of seed. And finally, trade rules and regulations. And these aim to increase market size or competition by opening up the seed system allowing inflows of foreign investment, new genetic resources, and new supplies of seed. Through such levers as seed market liberalization, mutual recognition of approved or released varieties between countries, or harmonization of seed laws between countries. That's not a really long list of policy levers, at least not in my mind. Importantly, each of these policies can be applied 
at a specific point in the supply chain, in the seed supply chain, at the point where breeding takes place, at the point where seed multiplication takes place, and at the point where marketing and distribution of seed take place. So it sounds like we could almost build a flow chart, like the one in front of you, or a checklist, or a dashboard of indicators for each country and each crop, and use that to determine whether its seed market or its seed system was developing in the quote unquote right direction. We could use some very basic metrics and indicators, such as those put together by the World Bank and the uh, IFC under the Enabling the Business of Agriculture initiative, or the Access to Seeds initiative, or various studies by CGIR centers, their counterparts in national research systems, or in other scientific organizations. For example, some of the metrics we might want to think about are the average age of varieties grown by farmers. How long has a variety been in circulation since it was released by a company or by a public breeding program? Um, and that tells us really, you know, whether farmers are getting access to new genetics. Or seed replacement rates. What share of farmers purchase fresh seed each year rather than recycled seed? Or seed to grain or seed to commodity price ratios indicating the value of improved genetics and seed quality relative to the value of the commodity produced with it. Or the time and cost of varietal registration and release procedures and processes. Uh, or adherence by a country to international conventions and standards for intellectual property rights protection or plant variety protection. These are all very useful metrics to understand how a seed system is advancing. But I would argue against taking a purely sort of numeric or index-based view of seed systems development. Why? Because the design and implementation of seed policies occurs in hotly contested spaces. There are potential winners and losers in seed policy reform processes, just like in any other policy reform process. And it's important to keep in mind that each policy lever comes with its own profile of benefits, costs, risks, trade-offs, and unintended consequences. So this begs the question of how to proceed with policy reform efforts. And I'd say very carefully, with detailed analysis of costs, benefits, risks, trade-offs, and those unintended consequences. So to be fair, many countries have done almost exactly this. Many countries have introduced seed policy reforms quite carefully uh, and with great success. There are well-documented examples from India, Bangladesh, Kenya, Thailand, China, Vietnam, and South Africa, among many others. All have made dramatic changes, many of them dating back to the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, to update their seed policies and regulations, and in many cases generate positive outcomes for farmer access to better genetics and quality seed, industry growth and investment, and overall agricultural productivity growth. So if we want to think more about these reform processes, because really what began in the 1980s and the 1990s hasn't ended. Lots of countries are still further updating their policies and others are just embarking on that process now. I think the key design points that we might focus our analysis on are as follows. First, the rules for accessing better genetics. Second, the procedures for accelerating varietal release, getting better genetics out into the market or out to farmers. Regulations for assuring the quality of seed, the physical quality of seed. Investments for promoting new seeds and traits. And incentives for encouraging overall market growth. And I'd keep in mind and hope all of us would keep in mind that for every policy and regulation imposed on a system, there is a cost. A cost for the state to implement and monitor the regulation, a cost to the seed producer to comply with the regulation, a cost to the farmer that is passed on to the seed producer, a cost to society in terms of the broader economic effects of changes in the supply and quality of the crop or commodity in question, and a cost to the natural environment, including on-farm biodiversity. So our first order concern when thinking about these issues of policy reform and regulatory reform 
is to find that level of regulation or that sweet spot in regulatory costs that generates a large, vibrant, and competitive market for seed. Too much regulation, and we might crush the market's potential. That would be on the right side of the graph at row H. Too little regulation, and we might open the door for trade in substandard seed and traits, which is row L on the left side of the graph. So we're sort of looking for that sweet spot where the asterisk is. So let me offer some policy scenarios that capture crop and country-specific examples. Uh, keep in mind that these are very stylized and synthetic examples that, that I developed. And in reality, countries often pursue a very mixed set of policies that draw on individual elements from each of these scenarios. But, you know, taken together, these scenarios, I think, provide us, you know, with a stylized picture. They allow us to frame our thinking and analysis around several very useful models. So let's get started. First, strategy number one, integrate into the informal. This is a strategy applied to many traditional food crops and some major field crops as well. Consider a crop that's self-pollinated, open-pollinated, or vegetatively propagated from cuttings or buds or stems or things like that. In many countries, these aspects of reproductive biology mean that farmers can easily save seed without reverting to a seed provider each season. Under such circumstances, a better seed system depends acutely on access to the informal seed trade. So that means introducing better genetics and improved seed quality by providing support to projects that build farmers' capacity to select performant varieties and produce quality seed, leveraging collective action and social networks among farmers to, dis to disseminate improved varieties and quality seed, and concentrating formal seed system activities and scarce public resources into public breeding and extension activities to support, not usurp, but to support the informal sector. Many aspects of this strategy are reflected in the integrated seed systems sort of framework developed by my colleagues at Wageningen University and research in the Netherlands, among many others. You know, a good example of this approach is found in efforts to develop seed systems for cassava, sweet potato, yam, banana, and plantain in many sub-Saharan African countries. And these efforts are highlighted by a very limited focus on issues like bridal registration, seed quality certification, or intellectual property rights protection. That's not the focus. There's really a much bigger focus on farmer-first approaches to capacity development considerable investment of public resources in very long-term activities like training farmer seed producer groups and supporting small or medium-scale seed enterprises. And there's some very exciting work going on in this space. Public breeding programs designed to get new varieties straight out to farmers through research and extension pathways. Commercial investments in small-scale tissue culture labs and nurseries that provide clean, disease-free planting material to farmers. Development projects that train farmer groups to produce and market clean seed for root, tuber, and banana crops. And development projects that support women and youth farmers to move out from just production of these commodities and crops, but into higher value seed production and marketing activities. But to be honest, this strategy or this channel also requires time and patience, especially in the absence of a blockbuster new variety or a well-coordinated supply-driven promotion effort from the state. For every story of rapid varietal adoption and turnover, like Quincho Tef variety in Ethiopia, or the Seher 06 variety of wheat in Pakistan, where farmers quickly adopted within a matter of three to six years, these new varieties, for every example like that, there are many more examples of varieties that are slowly making inroads with farmers or even didn't get off the ground. Let's move on to another strategy. Formalize the informal. So this might be the opposite of what I just described. And though many of us may not realize it, this is the scenario that is fast becoming our reality for many of the crops and many of the countries we work in. In effect, we observe many governments investing in more formal seed systems and the policies and regulations required for formal systems to maintain control over variety 
registration and release, to enforce and monitor quality assurance with strict inspection systems, to encourage private investment with quality standards or intellectual property rights protections, to discourage farmer production and marketing of seed, to extend state control and regulation over informal trade, and to integrate recommended varieties into input subsidy programs, among other things. There are good reasons to take this approach in some instances, especially where the genetic and physical quality of seed found in the market can be problematic, or where there are concerns that seed providers are taking advantage of those asymmetries of information I described earlier. So Kenya is a really useful example of this. Uh, their regulator, the Kenya Plant Health Inspectorate Service, or KEFIS, may be one of Africa's strongest regulators. It's an impressive group of people and an impressive organization. And, you know, in effect, through their hard work, they've weeded out incidents of malfeasance in the maize seed market in Kenya through strict regulation, something that neighboring Uganda is now trying to tackle itself. But crop specificity is the key here. What works for maize may not work for, say, potato in Kenya. Kenya's recently amended seed laws, amended last year, 2016, states that, and I quote, a person shall not offer seed for sale unless it has been certified or it has met minimum standards prescribed for the class and species. So that's fine for maize, but when applied to potato, this translates into zero tolerance for seed-borne pests and diseases that might in any way threaten farm production. Okay, there's some strong logic in this strategy, right? You don't want pests and diseases on your farm. But the law effectively renders farmer-to-farmer -farmer seed exchanges illegal, at least on paper. And the law may also re render a lot of work by development practitioners illegal if their projects aid or abet non-certified seed production and trade. We discovered this in recent field work on potato in Kenya with my colleagues from the International Potato Center and the Roots and Tubers uh, and Bananas uh, CGR research program. So unfortunately, Kenya's legalistic approach to the problem runs smack into ground realities. In theory, the formal approach would be an effective way of getting high quality, pest and disease free potato seed into the market. But there are real problems with this approach. There are only a few credible producers of certified potato seed in Kenya, two to be exact. Their annual output doesn't represent a fraction of the country's seed requirement for potato. The government of Kenya simply doesn't have the resources to monitor and enforce this law, which requires field and uh, seed potato production facility inspections and strict application of this zero tolerance threshold I described. And there's really no opening in the legislation for, say, a seed class or a standard below certified, such as what we call quality declared seed, uh, which would allow farmers themselves to produce and market clean seed at a slightly lower standard of quality. Worse yet, if you think about the logical extension of this uh, law, uh, apply it to sweet potato, right? Sweet potato is very different than potato. They're not even related, I believe. Um, the formalization of the informal seed sector in sweet potato uh, has actually caught the attention of some of my colleagues working on orange flesh sweet potato. Sweet potato planting material or seed is, are actually vines, and they're exchanged almost exclusively through informal systems. But the application of these types of seed certification certification standards by KEFIs that I just mentioned, you can imagine could, if applied, have a chilling effect on the exchange of sweet potato vines between farmers. All right, let's move on to another scenario. Formalize where it matters most. This is a, a more pragmatic strategy in which countries mandate varietal testing for strategic crops only, food security crops like major food cereal staples, uh, in which countries require quality assurances for early generation seed only. Those are the, the types of seed, such as pre-basic, basic, and foundation seed that need higher levels of genetic and physical purity than the large quantities of bulk seed sold to farmers. So sort of the feedstock in the production process, if you will, the higher level upstream uh, materials. Um, 
this strategy allows farmers to produce, to produce and sell both uh, seed informally and even through commercial channels if they choose. Uh, it allows for the introduction of lower quality standards for farmer produced seeds, such as the quality assured or quality declared seed I mentioned earlier. And it encourages private investment in commercial markets at the same time. In effect, the strategy trades off the cost of regulation against the value and probability of losses resulting from poor genetic or physical quality, including susceptibility to pests and disease. It's sort of a, a social cost-benefit analysis. We're willing to take on the hazard and, and the probability of, of uh, pests and diseases in exchange for uh, lower regulatory hurdles. The strategy also balances informal and formal sector activity with a long-term eye to uh, integration. And this can work for certain crops, but it doesn't work for all crops. Uh, and it's generally found in, in sort of the high volume, low margin seed markets, markets for legumes and pulses, uh, markets for, for rice and wheat, uh, markets for some types of roots, uh, tubers and banana crops as well. Let's move on, sorry, going back. Uh, you know, I just came back uh, from Vietnam where I was with a, a number of my colleagues from, from the International Potato Center and, and from SEAT, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, uh, as well as our Vietnamese counterparts. Um, and, I, and I was astonished at how casual the regulatory system is there around the production and distribution of planting material for cassava. Now, for those of you that know cassava in the context of Africa, you know that it's largely a, a crop that is processed and consumed for food. In Vietnam, it's almost exclusively an industrial crop, a starch crop um, for industrial application and use. The only real controls on genetic and physical quality of planting material occur at the research station level. Farmers go to those stations and they get new varieties or some clean planting material. Uh, cassava steaks, they're called, and they transport them uh, you know, to their farms and they exchange them among each other uh, very informally. And that seems to work. Now, more recently, there's been an emergence of cassava mosaic disease, the Sri Lanka strain, which is not as damaging as what's found in sub-Saharan Africa, but also pink mealybug, the vector in, in uh, a disease called witch's broom. Um, and both of those lead to uh, yield losses, but not, not devastatingly so. And instead of having a regulatory system that controlled the uh, seed-borne diseases and pests such as these, local authorities simply contained the disease on the back end. Uh, there's really no other way to regulate the informal market to prevent the spread of the pests and disease, so they just chose to contain it and destroy crops where the disease was found. Uh, so that's a regulatory trade-off right there, but but I would I would caution uh, about this type of example and its applicability to other situations in other countries and for other crops. These regulations can also have unintended negative consequences if they impose standards on seed markets that are already functional. So don't assume for a minute that farmer saved seed is necessarily inferior to certified seed or quality declared seed in the first place. In effect, having these lower standards might just be a new cost imposed on farmers and other seed producers without commensurate benefits in terms of quality. All right, let me move on to another strategy. Focus on commercial potential. So for certain crops, there is abundant opportunity to let commercial interests drive seed sector growth. I won't say too much about this strategy because it underwrites a narrative it should be fairly obvious to many of us. This highlights, the highlights of this strategy center around the creation of an enabling environment with limited regulatory oversight. And this includes allowing for automatic or voluntary varietal registration, a very low cost entry into the market, if you will, allowing for truthful seed labeling rather than formal certification and strict inspection, enforcing plant breeders' rights and IP protection, and opening up markets so that farmers and breeders can respond to price signals. So this describes many countries' experience with hybrids and their special reproductive biology that requires farmers to purchase fresh seed every season if they want to enjoy the genetic gains conferred by hybridization or heterosis, as it's called. 
Examples include hybrid maize in Zambia, South Africa, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Thailand, and many other countries. Hybrid sorghum, millet, uh, pearl millet, and pigeon pea in India. Hybrid rice, increasingly, in Bangladesh, Vietnam, and China. Uh, and vegetable crops throughout Asia. Many, many others. But again, a word of caution. This should not imply that such commercial markets actually function well. There are concerns in some countries that private companies with a strong market position have chosen to invest in preserving that market power, or that position, rather than invest in innovation. So a company, let's say, with a blockbuster hybrid that all the farmers love may be more likely, more willing to invest in protecting its market power, keeping out competitors, and encouraging the government to set up regulatory barriers rather than incur the costs of introducing new seeds and traits to farmers. This raises questions about the role of regulation, especially antitrust regulation and competition policy in ensuring seed market competition. We've done precious little on this topic outside of the study of, of uh, the biotech industry, but I'd argue that it's time we took these issues more seriously in our research. Finally, I draw your attention to the last strategy in my list, the self-regulation strategy, or farmer self-regulation. that has been central to the experience in many industrialized countries. So this strategy draws on the power of collective action and farmer-based organizations to finance crop breeding, organize seed production and marketing, assure quality through self-regulation of its farmer members, and generate the basis for profitable enterprises in the long run. So during my, my short summer holidays, I drove through the town of Ashton, Idaho, population 1,237, very small place, in the lovely county of Fremont, Idaho. So Ashton, as you can see in the picture at the bottom of the uh, screen, is the self-proclaimed seed potato capital of the world, though I'm sure some of our Dutch colleagues would suggest otherwise. So seed production, or seed potato production in Ashton, is entirely managed by a farmer-based organization. It's listed right there, the Ashton Seed Growers Association. Technical standards are set by the state. Testing may be done by independent labs. But that Seed Growers Association assumes responsibility for quality. That's the way it's done for many crops in many industrialized countries. It's actually what gave us Limagran, a French cooperative that represents the world's largest wheat seed company today. There's clearly potential for this approach uh, to advance informal seed systems, as I described them earlier, to a much more substantive role in a formal seed system. But policies, regulations, and investments for an enabling environment, especially one that supports farmer-based organizations, are really key to this story. So, to wind up, let me give you a couple of quick slides. First, I'll re reiterate a few key points. Policies designed to strengthen seed systems are very crop and country specific. This figure sort of maps commercial viability of the seed market for a given crop against its social or economic value. You could argue with where I place the crops and their associated strategies in this schematic. In fact, you should argue with my figure because where we place a crop or a strategy really depends on biological, institutional, commercial, and social factors that are unique to each country's experience. Furthermore, I would argue that political economy and policy processes also matter. How does a country actually navigate the policy change process? And here we need to consider a number of variables. Where the change process occurs, is this a, a regulatory policy imposed at the center, or is there sort of a, a district, a province, a state, a local uh, element to it? What are the roles, interests, and power of key actors in the system, and how do they complement each other, and how do they conflict with each other? Uh, what are the complementary investments in both the hard and soft infrastructure of a market and a system needed? And what are the technical, organizational, and regulatory capacities required for these types of reforms? So in conclusion, I say there are no easy answers. There are just no silver bullets in this story. There's a lot of on-the-ground experience and abundance of global expertise, but also more questions. I think in recent years, we've brought more structure to our thinking around seed systems 
And it's a clearer narrative that's not solely built on the public sector's experience with wheat or the private sector's experience with hybrid maize. There's just a lot more experience out there with different crops in different countries that we need to take note of. And finally, I'd say this. As country after country updates and renews and refreshes its seed policies, we face, I think, an urgent need to generate new evidence and insights on what really works in seed policy design, reform, and implementation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, David. That took us through a lot of material. We've had some questions that came in, but I think because we're managing the questions and the discussion in this way, it gives me a privileged position to come in in the beginning and ask a, a few of my own. Um, I was very impressed by your list of the challenges um, in workable seed systems. Um, and you, you took us later in the presentation through a number of approaches to addressing those challenges, and I appreciated that. But fundamentally, if I step back, um, those challenges are there. But when we look at the middle income and the high income countries, they seem to get resolved one way or another. Um, seed, seed systems work. I, I was very interested in your presentation to hear about farmer organizations involved in seed production in the high income countries. I hadn't really been aware that that was still such an important issue. But you know, for an, in a number of ways, the, the institutional, organizational um, issues are addressed in middle and high income countries. And they seem to be more of a persistent challenge in the low income countries. And if that is a kind of um, stylized fact of, of seed systems, does it raise the question of sort of demand um, and the, you know, the, the income levels of farmers and their ability is, is good seed essentially a, you know, a superior good, um, you know, something that only becomes um, operative at a certain level of, of income and performance of an agricultural system. Well, I think maybe what we've seen in the 30 years or so that I've been involved in you know, the agricultural development business is a lot of efforts to kind of retrofit solutions, which might not really be appropriate for the environment. And you took us through a number of examples of, of, of those. Um, so I, I guess I'm one of the questions that came in said, are, are we are we maybe going about it in the wrong way if we try to think of seed systems in isolation from the overall economic context of the agricultural sector. I think in your presentation, you gave us a lot of um, examples of how we're actually looking at them you know, in, in the context. But uh, I guess that question about seed systems in isolation versus seed systems as part of the whole process of, of technical change and which is the chicken and which is the egg, um, I think that question is related to the one that comes to my mind, which is, um, is there a kind of natural evolution of these things that happens with increased commercialization, with structural change, with you know, rural transformation? Um, is there a dimension there that we should be kind of observing and thinking about it? Would it be helpful in coming to an understanding of what might work in different environments? That's a great question great set of questions uh, with no easy answer. I think the the, the upshot of, of what you're pointing out is this sort of demand side perspective on, on seed systems and markets. So to what extent, extent does demand for uh, a crop or a commodity or demand for uh, certain attributes like taste or cooking quality um, or, or color and shape uh, in that crop uh, drive demand among farmers, and you know, as as markets mature, as consumers drive uh, decisions made on the farm uh, more actively, uh, you know, how does that shape the seed system? I, I point out two things. One is that um, we probably shouldn't discount farmers' demand for better genetics at a very basic level. 
where subsistence needs are being met. We've had great experience with the introduction of better varieties to farmers who were not producing surpluses for the market. Farmers can recognize better genetics uh, and they have and better quality planting material, and they have done so for thousands of years. Um, simply augmenting or strengthening that process uh, and, and meeting that localized demand is, is I think, really important. Part of that story is the Green Revolution, uh, and many of the works still going on, many of the projects and, and breeding programs still going on in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, are all about you know, helping farmers meet their subsistence needs in, in millet, sorghum, uh, and other grain uh, grains and, and legumes. Um, but yes, as as markets mature, as consumers drive choices, as companies enter enter markets, um, certainly things change, and the demand for seed is really driven by uh, derived from demand for commodities and, and, and other things uh, in the in the larger economy. So absolutely, we, we see uh, that maturation as occurring in, in many countries, and it's exciting. It's absolutely exciting to see because there's so much diversity in the seed system that emerges because of that. Potato is not like sweet potato. Rice is not necessarily like wheat. Uh, there's lots of space uh, for many different actors to play a role in that and uh and it's not simply a supply driven story of getting you know new genetics and planting material out to farmers yeah. one of the things i appreciated in your presentation and in your work is the specific examples of particular innovations in particular countries that are actually delivering good things you know innovations in in the uh, distribution and and production of seed now we had a, a very interesting question um Given what you've said about the, the complexities of the uh, seed systems, what is a good division of labor? What is the role between um, uh, international agricultural research organizations and national institutions, either um, you know, the national researchers or you know, companies that are based nationally? How should we think of many of our participants are you know, have CGIR.org um, email addresses. Um, can you give us some, some thoughts about the role of international agricultural research in relation to um, local actors in seed systems? Sure. So that's getting to be a really um, complex question in, in the CGIR. How, you know, how does the CGIR relate uh, to other actors in a, in a seed system? The traditional channel was uh, CG centers, Providing elite germplasm uh, uh, finish, and finish lines to um, national research partners in the public sector, who would then uh, register and release those varieties. And extension programs, state-owned seed enterprises, and the like would would get them out to farmers. But several CG centers, starting even 25 years ago or so, said, "Well, wait a minute. That's not the only channel available. So let's make our germplasm." Uh, you know, our, our elite material available to private companies or farmer organizations or, or farmers themselves. Um, and, and that's when, you know, the exciting uh, innovation and, and a lot of tension began. Um, there are cases where, most cases, where CG centers have provided private companies with access to their elite materials uh, on a non-exclusive basis. And that's, uh, that's worked fairly well. Uh, companies have uh, gotten early access to material from ICRISAT, from CIMIT, from SIAT, from many others. Um, and where seed markets are, are nascent or still developing, many of these companies can turn a profit for a pretty long time uh, by using that elite material in their own breeding programs. Um, and that, you know, that works out really nicely. Uh, at some point, of course, those companies start competing with each other. Um, and uh, then it becomes a question of, well, can the CG provide exclusive access for a given company, maybe for a limited time, uh, to that elite germplasm, uh, giving the company you know, uh, a certain competitive edge over other companies? And that's become more controversial uh, only under extreme circumstances do CG centers uh, consider that idea. Uh, but the point is that, you know, 
there is this diversification of how CG centers interact with uh, other actors in the seed system. Another dimension of this is that in recent years, many of the development partners, donors of the CG, have said, well, you know, you guys have to really show on the ground impact. You have to get your varieties out to farmers, and we want to see evidence of that. And that means that CG centers now have to look even harder, even deeper at those very seed systems they depend on. Now, whereas in the past, CG scientists uh, knew with their national partners how to navigate regulatory requirements, especially around varietal registration and release, all of a sudden, some CG centers uh, involved in, in projects trying to show real impact on the ground are saying, wait a minute, this registration and release system is really holding us back from showing impact. Or this seed quality assurance system, these regulations, are holding us back from showing impact. We need to engage in the policy processes to change these things. Um, 25 years ago, most CG centers hovered above that and said, well, you know, we can help make those regulations, but, but they're really not our business. Now, they're our business. Well, and they're the business of PIN as well, and that's why we're very delighted to have your work on seed systems within the, the, the program. Now, you, were, you gave us a cautionary note about how um, probably there's no one index of the performance of a seed system that would work for all countries. But at the same time, I mean, that's not terribly, okay, we accept that there are no silver silver bullets, there's no one easy index, fine. But we still want to know, you know, what things are working well. And if we're um, involved in a particular country or we're in a dialogue with the you know, country, you know, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Finance, and trying to figure out what are our high priority <coughs> issues, um, they would want to know how bad are our seed systems. Mm -hmm. So is there some um, metric that even if it's a, you know, a, a rather loose one, um, that would allow observers to see whether you know, the main problem is one of you know, trade barriers or the main mm -hmm. problem is one of underinvestment in agricultural technology mm -hmm. or the main problem is one of you know, just a really dysfunctional seed system. You've got all sorts of good things that could happen, but you can't get anything out because you have this blockage in your seed system. So is there some way to you know, provide a, a, an assessment of um, the performance of a seed system that would be helpful for diagnostic purposes? Sure. I mean, there's no one metric for any given policy. Uh, issue I mentioned, but there are a number of uh, indicators or measures or metrics uh, that are that are worth uh, pursuing further. And, and a great source for this is the, the World Bank Group's uh, Enabling the Business of Agriculture Index, where they have a country by country query that you can you can use to look at different seed system metrics. Um, you know, some of my favorites are a uh, number of varieties released uh, in a given country. Now that assumes they have a, a release registration procedure uh, system. Um, and this calculation uh, that I could have presented in excruciating detail but didn't on varietal age, or the age of varieties being cultivated by farmers, um, weighted by uh, area under cultivation. Um, and there, you know, in country after country, uh, you know, you find that there are these blockbuster varieties that have been out there for 20, 25 years, and they haven't turned over. And then every once in a while, something comes along. And like I mentioned, uh, Quincho, a, a variety of teff in Ethiopia, or Sehero 6, which has a semit, uh, simit uh, lines in it, uh, in Pakistan, for wheat, um, that were introduced and turned over really fast. I mean, farmers just picked this up and said, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, it becomes sliced bread. <laughs> it's coming. Some of them will. Uh, so, so you know, that's that's an interesting and, and very useful measure. It's not perfect, uh, but it is useful. We've been investing a lot in improving our ability to uh, uh, to uncover sort of the the underlying numbers we use in these studies. So, uh, you know, adoption surveys and studies and the application of remote sensing and other other tools, to DNA fingerprinting, to try to improve our measurement of adoption area or number of households, and number of acres and hectares uh, under a given variety. Um, 
that continues to be very difficult work, but uh, but necessary to to improve the quality of the indicators that we ultimately might rely on for policy advice. Um, and then there's some other ones along the way. I and mean, one of my favorites is uh, you know the World Bank Group's numbers on the cost and time of releasing a new variety in, in a given country. Uh, how much how much does it cost in terms of I think it's as as a as a share of capita or something like that. Um, you know that's based on the doing the business. Um, was it the ease of doing business index? They sort of adapted it for agriculture, and it's a useful it's it's a useful indicator to say well you know how easy is it to get something into the market in this country? Um, and then there are other regulatory indicators that are important along similar lines. So if you have a set of indicators like that. Um, that help you identify some of the issues that should be addressed and the penalties that are being imposed on the economy by these problems in the seed um, sector and the seed system. How open are countries to fixing those? What has been your experience? Is there demand on the part of um, parliaments and ministries and to you know go in and fix these? And I I ask because. You know, it seems to me this has been a, a recurrent theme yeah. in yeah. Um, interaction with um, low-income, agriculturally-based countries um, for years. And so I'm wondering about the openness of, of countries to accept some of the policy recommendations that would make the agricultural sector much better. So it's a really, really probing question. It's important to, it's important to ask. I think it, this goes back to the very point that there are different interests at stake in a seed system. So for instance, if you use an indicator like number uh, number of days or, or you know, the cost of getting a new variety registered and released in a country, and that country was Kenya, many of us, you know, working in the CGIR might say, yes, let's lower the cost and lower the time to release. Uh, CalRO, Kenyan Agricultural Livestock Research Organization, and KEFIS, which I mentioned earlier, the regulator, might actually disagree. They say that number should really be higher because we don't want low quality genetics in our system or in our market. So if you go to parliamentarians uh, in Kenya and say, you know, we're going to lower the, reduce the time and lower the cost of regulatory, then the, the director of Kefis might come back to that same parliamentary committee and say, oh, no, you don't. Kefis is here for a reason. We're protecting the farmer. Now, that's probably one of the, one of the, the biggest conceptual challenges. What role does, do state or, or regulators play in protecting the farmer versus enabling new opportunities for the farmer? And that's where the biggest tension occurs in seed system. Um, and that's where you know, that political economy question comes into play. I think by raising political economy, you're kind of one step um, away from thinking about some of the ethical issues. Um, and we have had one of one of our participants has asked about you know, the ethical dimensions of, of um, management of seed systems, um, perhaps. And I'm not even sure what. Well, what are the ethical issues? Um, you've been working in it and thinking about it. Um, I could think of a list myself, but they probably wouldn't be as well informed as yours. Well, there are lots of ethical issues. So, so one is sort of the, the ethics of uh, environmental sustainability, right? To what extent are we introducing, uh, you know, low varietal diversity and, and making ourselves more prone to pests and diseases because everybody's growing the same varieties with the same susceptibilities um, and and not sort of tapping the natural biodiversity that we need to conserve uh, because you know we're otherwise wiping it out um, so that's a, an ethical consideration uh, there's the ethical consideration of um, from a Marxist perspective looking at uh, you know whether seed and the genetics embodied in seed are the means of production owned by the farmer versus owned by the capitalist. Um, and there's there's a, lots of really interesting literature on that. I'm much more pragmatic when I look at these issues and, and I ask, well, you know, what do farmers want? Can we prescribe 
what farmers want? Can we prescribe the ethics? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, in many, many cases, you see that farmers, they choose, you know, with their own wallet, with their own purse strings, with, with their own choices. Uh, a farmer may prefer a high yielding variety. Another farmer may prefer uh, a variety that has a particular taste. A farmer may be willing to pay for the seed and buy it from the market. Um, you know, the classic example of this is rice, let's say, right? Rice is very, very, there's a big ethical component to rice. It's, it's in national, uh, it's part of national cultures. It's part of people's identity. It's part of people's religion in many countries. And yet farmers increasingly buy rice from, rice seed from the market. Uh, conserving, you know, traditional varieties and all that is good and fine. But farmers choose instead to harvest their crop, sell the commodity, and go back to the market and buy a seed. In India, the rate is anywhere between 35 and, and 65 percent of farmers buy rice seed every year, despite the fact that they could save from their harvest and replant. So, you know, th there are lots of ethics around this, but I think we prescribe a lot too much, a, a lot, maybe too much. Okay, well, I'm sure we could talk more about that. Actually, we could talk about a lot of these issues much longer, but we don't have the time because we're already one minute over. But I want, David, to thank you. I want also to thank our participants. I want to give you one more question. You're working in this area now. You're actively working, and you've given us exposure to some of the um, findings that you have. What do you see as the most exciting uh, piece of, of research, the most exciting issue with regard to seed systems that you're working on now? The most exciting. Yes. Well, at, the the kapow one. The kapow <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, there's there, there's so much interesting work going on around roots, tubers, and bananas. And I was just with my colleagues uh, in Vietnam and, and uh, uh, Kenya, and I'll be in Nigeria next week, uh, looking at these issues uh, with with colleagues from roots, tubers, and bananas (CRP). Uh, I think you know we 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 don't think enough about those types of crops. Uh, you know, we fixate on on either the the wheat story, you know, the, the Norman Borlaug story of public breeding and public distribution of better wheat varieties, or the maize story, you know, the revolution in hybrid maize driven by the private sector, um, beginning in the United States and moving around the world at lightning speed. But it's those more marginal stories, uh, the crops that don't get enough attention from breeding or commercial activity, that to me are the most exciting because our diets are diversifying i hope they're diversifying and they're not everything's going to be about maize rice and wheat in the future and it's really exciting to think about how seed systems fit into a very different future around very different consumption choices okay well thank you very much thank you david spielman for joining us and sharing your thoughts on strengthening developing country seed systems and markets policy trade-offs unintended consequences and operational realities